In parts of the United Church of Christ, we often sing psalms and other things with sung responses. And I thought, well, we'll give it a try. You did well. Luke 1, second half of verse 46. And that's on page 49 in the New Testament part of our Pew Bibles. Why does he do this this slow? Because this gives you a chance to find it too. This is again the song of Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Cry out. Cry out for the future. There are those who say that a 15 or 14 or 16 year old girl from Nazareth probably couldn't have come up with that poem. That she wasn't smart enough or educated enough. Others go the other way and say, well, she wasn't just a simple girl from Nazareth and they invent all this royal Jesus stuff where she somehow descended from a line of high priestly folks in Jerusalem and is very well educated for a woman and penned it herself. There's lots of stories about Mary. One of the oddest ones is that finally in the 19th century, the Western Roman Church decided that Mary didn't die at all. She got swooped up like Ezekiel. I mean, it's like, it's not Ezekiel. Oh boy, that's terrible when you have this memorized and you can't do it. Elijah. Elijah gets picked up by a chariot of fire that comes swooping down and Elisha looks and says, the boss has been taken to heaven. But in addition to that story about Mary not actually really dying, there's also, if you go to Jerusalem, a second century church set in a tomb down at the bottom of the Mount of Olives, down in the valley before you go back up to the city of Jerusalem, and it's called the Tomb of Mary. The stories about Mary, and they're all post-New Testament stories, are A, that she lived with Jesus' brother James, who again gets edited out of the story in some places, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem, who probably was a very devout Jew who didn't buy anything his brother said until after he was resurrected. And then I have this image of Jesus coming to James and saying, James, do you get it? I'm back. And he goes, Oi, how could I be so stupid? Any rate, Mary, who is basically a mom who shows up periodically in the three synoptic gospels, saying to Jesus when he starts his ministry, You're acting nuts. You need to come home. And he says, No, I can't do that. My family is those who do the will of God. Sorry, mom, not doing it. <sighs> Mary is probably a big influence as she survives in the church in Jerusalem. And there's a further legend that not just that she stayed in Jerusalem until the city was sacked and fell and then fled with other Jewish Christians, but that maybe she fled as far as Ephesus and Ephesus has a big claim on Mary being there through her death. This is not to be confused with Mary of Magdala, which is a whole other story of stuff. And if you want to read Dan Brown, you can find the most fanciful accounts of Mary Magdalene that you want to. This is Mary the mother. The story goes that the angel, nine months ago, the angel came to Mary and said, 
Guess what? You're really favored by God. But you're going to be pregnant out of wedlock. Now, instead of just running for the door, Mary was a woman of faith. And so, first of all, she took a big deep breath. And then she said, how can this be? And then the angel explained some, some, not near everything. And she said, okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I was taught as a young feller in the Midwest to know the difference between good girls and bad girls. And Mary, who's a good girl, in this story, gets treated like a bad girl until Joseph intervenes and says, we're already engaged already, let's get married. So they do. Now, I'm sure there was talk in town. Have you ever noticed the old saying, you know, everybody's second, third, fourth, and fifth childs take nine months, but if you notice that the first one just takes all sorts of different time? <laughs> Everywhere from 27 months down to two. And have you noticed that almost everybody in town keeps track? And that they quietly share the news with one another? Now, Nazareth is a town of a thousand. It's huge today, but it was a small working class village just outside the new capital of Sepphoris, about a three, four mile walk. And so people worked in town and then walked home if they were lucky enough to get a job at the new Roman construction projects. Joseph is listed as a carpenter the same way Jesus is. The technical term is tekron, which means handyman. Jesus the handyman, Joseph the handyman, and Mary, Mary's in to Joseph's family. She then gets weird news, and this is where people think she may have all sorts of priestly connections is, she has a cousin Elizabeth who's married to a priest named Zacharias, and guess what? They're expecting, after years of no hope, they're expecting. And so she goes to see her cousin. And while she's there, she says these words. Now, first of all, she's a fairly healthy girl because it's a 60 mile trip minimum, maybe 70 or 80. And she marches the whole distance down there. And she comes to see this miraculous birth about to happen. And while she's there, she says these words of prophecy. Now that's the setting of the story. I don't know about you, but I think sometimes education isn't measured in whether you showed up at school or not. It's measured in what you soaked up and what you know how to do and what has changed you the most. Have you ever noticed on Facebook you have those things? Dear Algebra, I did not use you again today. <laughs> I have four years of high school math that got me out of college math. Maybe that was a mistake not to take calculus, but I was a music major. Um, but I still remember many things I was taught that weren't necessarily in the curriculum, but were asides and things that made an impression on me. Maybe Mary was educated the same way. She didn't necessarily get to go to the local boys only Torah school, but she soaked up an awful lot. Because remember, the moms in Judaism are in charge of every Sabbath opening. They're the ones that pray the prayers. They're the ones that light the candles. They're the ones that declare that the Sabbath of rest is open. There's also this to be said. Don't you suppose by the time she's told the story of Jesus' birth over and over and over again to the people in Jerusalem and all the people that come to visit and say, oh, you've got to talk to Jesus' mother, Mary. She has this wonderful story to tell. Don't you suppose she might have polished the story a little bit? She might have edited? She might have Rethought and rethought and decided how to say it best of all. 
And don't you suppose maybe Luke, when he came to get this ready to present in his two-volume work of Luke and Acts to the Roman world, that he made sure to place it in this spot. Because as much as Luke wants to please the Romans, he wants the people to know that Jesus is the one sent by God to make the life different for everybody in the world. And so he puts this early in the gospel. How much of this happened? How much of this did this teenage girl actually say? All of it. I maintain she said all of it. I don't think she necessarily said it in these exact words that she may have had 30, 40 years later. But she said all of this. Her heart was overflowing with what God was doing in her. And it was scary. And it was wonderful. And it was joyous. And she gave herself into it fully. Now, I don't know about you, but a high school sophomore or junior, sometimes they can be wonderfully eloquent before they get knocked down by the world. And I think she probably did feel all of this. And she spoke it out as a prophecy, as a hope, as a dream for what her son could do in the world. Now, normally, the world is already gearing up for the post-Christmas sales. The minute we hit Christmas morning, the retailers will shift all the ads. About January, you will get your credit card bill, which reminds you of all the stuff that you just willy-nilly got to celebrate the season. Everything from the pre-done dinner to the way too extravagant present that you got for somebody you don't even quite remember. And all of that goes together because the world is marching on. But the church, we're not quite even ready for Christmas yet. We're still talking about Mary. We're starting to sing Christmas carols. And instead of, like the world, moving right on to the next big thing, we're going to stay here a while. We're going to stay from Christmas Eve, through the Sunday after Christmas, through the story of the arrival of the wise men and Jesus going to the temple and being dedicated. We're going to take time and enjoy all of that. And we're probably going to do more than the traditional 12 days of Christmas and we're going to be singing Christmas carols clear into January. And people are going to wonder, didn't you get the memo? Christmas is over already. Well, we're taking the time to say, no, it's not. The arrival of Jesus as a living human being into the world is worth celebrating and contemplating for quite a while. And it's worth on this Sunday before Christmas to take the time to see not only what God intends for each person when Jesus comes into the world, but what God intends for the whole world. I don't know about you, but I find a real echo in the song of Mary, O Magnify the Lord, hence called the Magnificat, with another story of the rich man and Lazarus. Or the rich man who was a fool and built extra storage barns and had a great crop and then God said, but what if you die tonight? Questioning what the world is worth, questioning what other things are worth is part of Jesus' arrival. Christmas is a time, and maybe it's because we're way far from the mainland, we have only put up two Christmas things in our house. No Christmas tree. Although we brought all the ornaments, boy did we ever. We have boxes of ornaments. But we decided we're going to let the children do that and we'll go look at their trees 
And we're not setting ours up, even though we brought in two. Why? For this first year, at least, we need a chance to just be at Christmas with you all. We need a chance to focus on what's going on over here, not in our house. I still have to figure a way to surprise Gail with her Christmas gift. I'm not sure how I'm going to pull that off yet. Nor am I saying any more. But I want us to keep it simple and direct. Because the more I studied this scripture, the more I have decided that Jesus comes to challenge almost everything we think counts. Almost everything that we have striven for. Almost everything that we have developed in our lives has to be reevaluated. Jesus comes to a world where about 2% of the people control 98% of everything on the planet. It's called the Roman Empire. And they're busy taking over villages and saying, I'm sorry, your land title's no good anymore. Claudius Publius over here now has the title, and I don't care if your family was here for a thousand years, get. Oh, you can stay, but you're going to work for shares. Sharecropping is not just an invention of the American South. Neither is day labor. You get a denarius a day, one little silver Greek coin. And on that, you feed your family. And if not, who cares? Sorry, this is what the wage is. If the minimum wage isn't high enough, too bad. We're Rome. Oh, you can't buy enough food to feed your family. Well, that's tough. This is all we're offering. That's the way the Romans did business. That's the way some people do business today. And then I read... He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. And that's only part of it. I don't know about you, but that can make me right uncomfortable. Because I rejoice at the fact that I'm finally doing fairly well in the ministry and that I have a wonderful, loving church and a decent salary, and a nice house, and a car. Which I thank you all for, but I also remember the times when I lived on a third less than I make, I mean, a third of what I make now, and we were raising three children. Many of you remember the same thing. You were young, you were struggling, you didn't have a lot, and then all of a sudden, whammo! Real estate went up in Kauai, and you might not be making any more money, but all of a sudden, you were rich. You lived in a half-million-dollar house. I have to say to you that all of this can go poof, people. It can disappear in a minute. All of that accrual of stuff where we have been blessed, and we have been blessed in many ways, has to be called into question and perspective when Mary proclaims God's will. Now she ties it to God's love of Israel. She ties it to the experience of her people. She ties it to the whole message of the Bible. But... His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. We have to say that Jesus came as a poor peasant child, became a relatively unknown country preacher, until he showed up in Jerusalem and challenged the way things are. And said, God wants it different. And the people who were in charge of the way things are grabbed him and smashed him. That's what happened. 
But Mary's vision goes beyond that. And she, I don't think she knew it. I don't think anybody could imagine that somebody who carried this message, who was rejected and crushed by Rome, would still triumph. And I don't think many of us really believe that such a message works today, partially because many of us are a little too comfortable, me included. Maybe we need to remember when we were young and struggling and things were hard because it's okay to remember that God was with us in those days. It's okay to remember that when we didn't have much, we had all we needed. Sometimes we had to work awfully hard to get it, but it was there because God was faithful to us then. Maybe it's time to take a look at Christmas and not worry so much about do we have all of the food and all of the presents and all of the gifts and all of the trips planned, but instead to say, I will give my heart to him who came for me. I will side with Mary. It's okay if God turns the world upside down because God does love everybody. Now, the good news is God loves those who have a proper appreciation of what they have just as much as those that don't have much. If they surrender it, if it is not God in God's place. So I have to ask you this tough question as the close of the sermon. Is there room in your planning? Is there room in your list of stuff you brought for the dinner to follow this service? Is there room in your list of people that you still have to write cards to? Is there room in the satisfaction of, I have checked off all my list and bought all my presents, and boy, did it cost a lot. Is there room in the middle of all of that Christmasing for Jesus? The Jesus who says, your heart is more important than your possessions. The Jesus who says your time is worth more than your bank account. The Jesus who says your love for other people counts more than your power over the other people. Are we ready this Christmas to hear this prophecy that cries forth for the future? And are we as a church willing to cry out that we have a future because we are tied not to measures of success or numbers, or income, although, frankly, you do really well on all of those. But they're not the final measure. The final measure is, who do we welcome? Who do we celebrate? Who do we make room for? Is it for everybody? The great parable that we enact every Thursday is, we have people who are worth a lot, who stand and work in a kitchen so that those that don't have a lot can have a community meal where they're treated as friends. That's the one great parable this church teaches. I want to encourage us that worship becomes another one. That whoever you are, however you're dressed, however you come here, with whatever understanding you bring, you're welcome in this fellowship. Because Jesus wants to turn the world upside down. Jesus wants to have the content of your heart matter more than your checkbook. God wants your ability to help other people to be more important than what you drive. God wants your ability to make a home for other people where they can be heard and listened to and welcomed and appreciated is more important than what the contents are of your carport or the cost of your house. God wants us to make room in the inn. God wants us to make room in our hearts God wants us to become more loving, more secure in that loving, more caring because we know what really matters. That's the future. That's the future that will win others. Rich, poor, tall, thin, short, fat, whatever. To him. And that's our calling. To really celebrate Christmas by saying Jesus came. And you know what? He never left. Jesus came as a baby. He grew up. And you know what? He's still here. He's with us. And he helps us welcome all these other people. 
into his love. Final thing. If you've been coming here because this is the place that your parents and grandparents came, but you've always debated whether you wanted to actually be a part of the living life of Jesus, now is the day to decide. To say, I want to follow him. Wherever I go, whatever I do, I want him to be my guide. However you see that, come talk to me after church, and we'll find a way to help you grow and to make that known. Let this Christmas be the time when you celebrate the Jesus that Mary predicted and the Jesus who came and changed us all. Amen.